Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Terra, CRG, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corming Communities, AmTrust, Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hersha Hospitality, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., iFunding, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Knackle Group at Cushman & Wakefield, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Nah, I'll be in the Jersey Shore. Nah, you know what? I'm gonna gonna learn to cook. I'm gonna go, go to Los Angeles. I'm gonna go to Italy. I'm gonna come to New York. You know what? I want to be a chef. I started with pots and pans. I'm gonna be a chef. But I'm not gonna be a chef. I'm gonna be a chef. I'm gonna run a restaurant management company. I'm gonna run a catering business. I'm gonna be own a couple of restaurants. The owl, the market table, and the clam? Yeah, because I like fishing, and I like people, and I'm lucky I have Joey Campanero today. Thanks for being here. I'm so happy to be here, Michael. You have a very interesting history about your grandparents. Tell me about this fight that happened in 1935 with Grandpa, oh, and he had to leave. It happened before 35. Okay. Yeah, this happened in uh, either the late 1800s or early 1900s. So, so tell the story. So, um... You know, there was they, they had this land in Molise, which is in the... Now, this is your father's side. My, yep, my father, uh, Campanaro's side of the family. And, um, you know, there was a, a big garlic field. And um, my grandfather's brother hated garlic. And they got into a fight over a woman. And the well was... Uh, <clears throat> my, the well was on uh, my uh, grandfather's side of the land. So my grandfather's brother filled the well with garlic and it really got him angry. So uh, they had a big fight. With and a pitchfork? The, the story is that um, he went after his brother with a pitchfork and then he had to leave town. So he left and how did he end up in Philadelphia? He grabbed this girl and he got on the boat and they came to Philadelphia. I, I'm sure that time is when, you know, their people knew each other and, and had some so sort of connection. they had paisans or somebody in Philadelphia. Exactly. But you said to me, Grandpa, what, what kind of business was he in? He, he, he was, was in the people business. Right, he was a people person. He, he had a little monkey named, named Cheech yeah. and uh, had, a, uh, had him on a, a music, he had him on a chain with a cup and he had a music grinder. Let's tell me about mom's side. Um, <clears throat> my mother's grandparents came to Philadelphia as well. And the neighborhood that I grew up in is, uh, it's basically the first Italian American neighborhood, uh, in Philadelphia, the first, um, Italian American, all Italian American parish, St. Maria, uh, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, uh, is also in this neighborhood. The neighborhood's called Bella Vista. And so, um, my great grandmother, 
also was in Philadelphia, had uh, five children. Oldest was my grandmother, uh, Rose, Rose, Maria Rose Fulginetti. And, um, and so her, my great grandmother was ill. And so my grandmother took care of her and the children. And um, she had um, four brothers and they were all in the military in different departments, Air Force, Navy, Marines. Um, and um, yeah, they, it was a thriving neighborhood, um, blue collar, lots of, um, most of my family on my father's side worked, uh, worked for the city of Philadelphia and the fire department. Um, my uncles on my mother's side of the family worked in the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, one thing that was, you know, that always was the, the common denominator here with, with, our, with our families is food. And I'm sure with so many families, you know, but um, we make fresh pasta together. We'd always gather around a dinner table and food was a big focus. So before we get to the food, let's talk a little bit because you have a couple of pictures of Uncle Frankie. Uncle Frankie is who? He's a grand, great uh, uncle? My Uncle Frankie? No, he's my father's oldest brother. And um, he was always a mystery to me. I mean, he, he had amazing wardrobe. He had the best shoes. He had the coolest cars. Uh, I've n I never saw him angry. Um, he liked to drink. Um, I speak about him because he was the patriarch of the family. He was born, he was born in Italy, and um, his his father, my, my my grandfather Antonio, passed when my father was just ten years old. Um, and so, so he took care of. He was like the paternal. Exactly, and then we're talking about nine nine children, and um, a woman who hardly spoke English, Domenica. And um, that basically were a huge influence did on the neighborhood. Did you ever figure out what Uncle, Uncle Frankie did? Um, I know he worked for the, uh, the water department. Yeah, he worked for the city as well. But he was also a bartender at this amazing restaurant called The Saloon. The Saloon is still open. It, you know, The Saloon opened up as a bar, and now it's uh, uh, the Santor family owns it, Richie Santor. And, and uh, he would buy the adjacent building and then... It just expanded, and it was it's one of the most important restaurants in cool. my childhood. Now, you said to me your dad was a fireman, right? He started out as a fireman, and then he became, he worked his way up. He was a lieutenant, and then he became a captain. And then uh, during the 80s, he um, tried to go for the uh, battalion chief. Um, but at that time in the 80s, there, were, there was a balancing out of uh, the test scores to allow for... Uh, minorities to have a better chance and uh, my father actually got slighted and it really hurt him I mean he, he was dedicated to it he, he loved his job and you know as a captain he fell through a, a burning roof and he was forced to, to retire on disability and then he got involved also working for the city in another job right yes and then later on he uh, he got a job as an administrator for the school bus system Philadelphia uh, public school so how'd mom meet dad well, like I said, in the neighborhood, everything happened at church. They went right. to parochial school together, and uh, they 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 grew up one block away from each other, and they were childhood sweethearts. You have a total of three brothers. I have one sister, Michelle, and she's the oldest. Right, and two other brothers. And then Lou, and then Michael, and then me. So you said that your parents uh, had a place in Wildwood. Yeah. Also, in the early '80s, my father bought a um, he bought a house uh, down in North Wildwood. And that's where you got the taste of both fishing for clams, which we I know you like, and also uh, for the uh, for the food business. How do you how do you get involved with the food business? Well, I saw a boat that I wanted to buy, and it was a sunfish sailboat that I wanted to turn into a rowboat so that I could fish and crab at the back bay. And so I asked my father for some money, and he saw it as an opportunity to teach me a lesson. So he said, "Go get a job," and I went to the nearest business, which was a restaurant. It was called Captain Max, and um, I worked for directly with the chef every morning, uh, Steve McDonald, and um, I was his pot scrubber. So he would make the big soup pots with snapper soup or clam chowder, and and I'd actually have to crawl inside the pots <laughs> to scrub them. <laughs> 
And now, how many years did you do that? So I worked at Captain Max for four, maybe five seasons. And each each season, I would learn uh, something different in the kitchen. So then you, got, you became a sous chef eventually? Well, n no. It, 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 it happened a lot longer. It, that process for me was was a bit more uh, calculated. I wouldn't take a job unless I knew I was ready for it. And the reason is, Michael, is because I knew I wanted to be the boss. I've always wanted my boss's job, but I I needed to know that I could do every job before okay. I could ask someone to do it. So going back to Philly, you said to me you worked in a, what, a kosher deli or something? Yeah, I worked at a uh, Jewish deli, and that's where I learned how to slice locks. And right, you said you, you, were, you were a master slicer. You could be in the Zabar. Lice, uh, I, slice. Could, I think I could pull it off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you did this after school? Yes, this was all through. Um, I started working there in, in eighth grade and kept through high school. Now, you said you originally went to public school, and then you... Went there was a school district strike in the 80s, and um, our parents always wanted us to go to uh, public schools. F so for just a few years, um, in middle elementary, we went to Catholic school. Uh, I was the youngest, and so I, ultimately I graduated um, in 86. I graduated from... I went back to McCall Public School, which is in Center City, and um, I graduated from McCall in eighth grade. Now, you're still at this time working for the deli? Yes. Okay. So how do you decide that you want to go to Penn State? I'm not exactly sure how I made that decision, but I was interested in a few things. There were, they, I didn't want to go to the same school for four years. I was actually nervous about committing to it, um, but... There was at with Penn State, you can go for two years at a satellite campus, which was in Ogons, Philadelphia. Um, and then you can finish your other two years up at the main college. So what were you doing at Penn State the first two years? The first year. Because so the, so the, I got to the first year. By this time, I was working. I'd left the deli and I was working at the saloon restaurant as a valet parker, making a lot of money. Uh, there's um, and, and, and I met a group of friends that we we clicked and uh, we didn't know each other through high school, but in our first year of college, and these guys were all one year older than, than I was. And um, I needed them. I just needed to be surrounded by these guys, you know, like Michael Romeo, Alfonso DeFrancesco, John Zancoli, Vinny Sirianni. Now, were they, were they in the food business or were they were just good friends? Um, all good friends. Um, there was, you know, everyone is in the food business at some point. And if you live in South Philly, there's a connection to a food, <laughs> to a restaurant. Uh, the common connection uh, ends, uh, turned out to be uh, De Bruno Brothers, which is on 9th Street. It's an amazing cheese shop. Um, so, yeah, I meet these guys in, in, in college, and, and we, we basically created our own fraternity. We called it uh, Kappa Cappuccino. <laughs> After my first year, at Penn they went State. up there. They went after their second year, and I and I just couldn't I couldn't be in school without them. So I had to take an accelerated credit program in Italy. I went to Italy and uh, for credit, and I studied uh, ancient architecture, culture, and civilization. And uh, I was able to get those credits in order to to move up to the main campus. So you're at the main campus, and what happens next? Well, financial aid was very difficult uh, at that time. Um, my parents' status was um, was tricky, and uh, so I I needed to work, and so I worked at a restaurant, and I was a cook, and ironically enough, that restaurant was called the Deli. Also in State College. In State College, yeah. So you were sh you were a cook now. I was a line cook. A line cook, yep. and and it was a deli. It was the the restaurant was called a deli, but it was definitely an um, an American style restaurant. So how long do you stay there? Um, I was up at State College for an additional two years, and then I took a leave of absence. So you come back to Philadelphia to work again. And when do you s decide that you want to go to the culinary school? That was, you know, it, my friends were graduating college also, and that was also a factor. I was like, how am I going to do my last year without, this, without, without these guys? Um, I really embraced cooking. I was really good at it. I was, you wanted to be an architect. 
And I and I wanted to be an architect as well. It was right, very so they, confusing. Right, caught in the middle. Yeah, I mean, my high school was was the engineer high school of engineering and science, and so our homeroom table w was a, a drafting table, and so I had lots of experience with with um, with drawing, drawing architectural drawing, but totally different than cooking. Very different. Uh, but little did I know that my destiny would be to work with architects as I ended up opening restaurants. But we'll get to that in a second. Yes. So now you decide to take the courses at the Philadelphia School of Culinary Arts. Right, Philadelphia Restaurant School. Restaurant School. Right. And that's an 18-month program. 15, what, right? 15 to 18 yeah. months. And, we're, and you said to me, at the end of the program, as things happen in life, it didn't work out. You, you just com didn't finish the program. You had, you had like a month or two to go. And then what happened? So you, and then it was a moment to really make that decision. I mean, you moved out of the house. It was mom. time to move out of the house. And my brother Lou was working in Manhattan at the time. Uh, he had a he was a he had an executive chef job at a restaurant called Andiamo uh, up on 68th and Broadway. And he was connected in in the, the restaurant the, the the tiny restaurant world that we live in in Manhattan. And uh, helped me get a job. And uh, so, what do you you come to Manhattan to get a job at what level? It was called uh, garmage, which is a fancy French term for a salad guy. At this restaurant, it was a it was an intense, intense, pro, intense program. It was during a uh, tall food moment, and um, so plating was very very specific. Um, I would say that the culture of the food that we were making, it was a French, a bustling French cafe called Symphony Cafe, but it was also a, a group of chefs that worked with, uh, with and, and for uh, Charlie Palmer uh, and Dave Burke. And so my executive chef uh, was Neil Murphy, who um, he was, most of his training in the Navy and also uh, working with Charlie Palmer uh, Oriole. And also with Dave Burke, and so that style of cooking, uh, I, I embraced, um, and also it's the restaurant where I got to meet my my um, perpetual business partner, Mike Price. Right, uh, but Symphony closes, right? Right. So uh, you know, we were, there was a long weekend, and I got to go down to the Jersey Shore, and so I was down there, and the phone rings. Which, you know, there was no cell phones. And we're at the Jersey Shore. Everyone's not in the house. So why I even heard the phone ring, I don't even, it doesn't make sense. So I heard the phone ring and I run in and I get it. And it's a wonderful man named James Bradley. And so Jimmy said, hey, Joe, I heard your restaurant just closed. I read it in the Times. Um, I'm doing this gig with Jonathan Waxman. We're, we're uh, revitalizing Bryant Park and we're a part of this restaurant. Uh, it was when uh, Mayor Giuliani was uh, cleaning up 42nd Street. And he said, I want you to be a part of it. Why don't you come on board? So this um, was the opening of Bryant Park. And this was the opening of Bryant Park, yeah. And so... The grill. Bryant Park Grill, yeah. So I got a job there. Uh, just, you know, like I said, I don't want to embrace... I don't want to dive too far into it. So I, I was probably a very overqualified line cook. Uh, for three or four days. <laughs> but this was part of a larger organization, Michael Weinstein's yes. ARC Restaurants. ARC Restaurants. There. And ARC, Michael had built a good reputation, and he was expanding. And um, the line cook then gets an opportunity to move to Washington, right? Yeah. Yep. I was offered a sous chef position in the company. And um, the company had businesses in, in, um, in Washington, D.C. And... My specific task was to um, to go down to help out a transformation in the menu uh, at at B Smith's restaurant in Union Station. So I just learned so much, but I I was very young at the time. I was twenty two or twenty three years old at the time, and to you know I was exposed to this corporate. Inv it was not very corporate, but it, it was a corporate environment. A public company. Yeah, it was a public company. And um, I learned a lot, you know, at, at that age and, and, you know, with the energy that I had, 
you know, I just wanted to be the best. And I was such a go-getter at this moment. And I, I, I embraced culinary field. And that's when I knew at, you know, one point in my life, I was going to take an executive chef job. And then I was going to open my own business. But that's later. That comes later. But ARC gives you the opportunity to move west, right? Yes. So where do... So um, ARC was opening up, uh, having two major projects, one in Las Vegas and one in California. And uh, the restaurant in Las Vegas was the, all of the restaurants in New York, New York casino, hotel and casino. So... There was that, and there was also the uh, revamp of the executive dining room on the back lot of Universal Studios. So did you, were you at both locations, at Los Angeles and... So, Vegas? yeah, there were two things where whatever happens first, I would be a part of. Um, so it turns out that New York happened first in Las Vegas, and so I was a part of a, t a culinary team. My specific job was to uh, design the shelving in the uh, huge walk-in boxes for about 28 different restaurants. And each chef in their different restaurants wanted their walk-ins a certain way, and their shelving a certain way. And so I got to work with all of them. And, th and, then, and then you move out to Universal Studios, correct? And then at this point, the, the, the redo of the executive dining room, which, which doesn't happen very often, and this is a big deal. Uh, you know, um, this is an um, iconic place. The last Hollywood mogul had lunch there every day. And, uh, you know, the great Ron Meyer and, and um, Howard Weitzman, Sandy Kleiman, Steven Spielberg. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. And I would have to cook for these guys uh, for lunch five days a week. And it's whatever they want, whenever they want it. And I was definitely up to that challenge. There I worked. My boss, uh, his name is Andrew Humbert. So he, he, Andrew Humbert was a chef for Paul Prudhomme for many years. Right, and Andrew and I both worked for Jonathan Waxman, and so it's it's all tied together. Very small world, and um, and it's our business to know about other people and to work together. So now it was time to come back to New York, right? You know, I got a call again from Jimmy Bradley, <laughs> and he said, "Joe, I'm opening a restaurant in West Chelsea. You want to come back?" And I said, "No." I don't want to open a restaurant in West Chelsea in 1998. I was having too much fun in L.A. Um, and so another year goes by, and he's, Jimmy's, Jimmy's expanding. He's, he had a hit on his hands when he opened up the Red Cat, and he had an opportunity to open more restaurants. So he called me again and said, uh, we're making a restaurant in Tribeca. Called the Harrison. Called the Harrison. And so I came to, to see if, if this was going to work out for me. Uh, I still hadn't never seen my name in the paper or on a menu as executive chef, and it was time, and you know, Jimmy was instrumental. He gave me my first shot at, to be the executive chef and to get a better taste of the business responsibilities, um, and it was an amazing opportunity that I took. So you come back in, this is 2001? That's correct. I moved back to... Uh, all, all throughout 2001, uh, leading up to September, uh, was right. back and forth. And Harrison was supposed to open up, I believe, near September 11th or on. It was actually the 17th was our slotted opening date. Right, and, and that full was, staff. That was postponed for a couple of months. It was actually just postponed for one month, a uh, month and a week. So we, we ended up opening on the 28th of October. But it was a tough market because Lower Manhattan was... Uh, I'll tell you, the toughest market was actual um, cooks. I couldn't get anybody to work with me. Uh, we had a full-on dedicated service staff, which was some of the most unique people I've ever had the opportunity to work with, or even, let alone meet. Everyone was such a character, and Jimmy did a great job. Jimmy and Danny Abrams uh, did a great job of um, corralling and building this team. Um, and most of the managers that were of that team now own their own businesses. So then it's what is it's 2006. You say, I'm a chef. I've learned management. I'm going to go it on my own. What happened? Yeah, it was time for me to, to move on. And, and, um, uh, Jimmy and Danny were very supportive of that. They actually gave me some money to do it. And, uh, um, I was married at the time. And, uh, my ex-wife found this, this 
awesome location and said, call this number. And now, this location was the original set for the Friends show, right? Little did I know that the exterior of this building is used on a TV show Friends. They show the exterior of the building, and the next scene goes right into the apartments where Chandler and Joey lived and Rachel. So you see this building, and how, what was it, the owl across the street? It's a really interesting intersection. On one corner is a public school, and then another corner is the little owl, and then the other two corners are these very unique and very old buildings, uh, townhomes. Um, one of them is one of the last wooden buildings left down there. And on the top is this really cool carved out little owl. And when it's windy, its head spins around. And so, so this is how we're going to name that. We're going to name this restaurant the Little Owl. And the Little Owl received outstanding reviews by a number of people. And it also helped you get onto the TV circuit. Yes. There. Yep. I um, was making friends really, really quickly. And, um, you know, Jonathan Waxman was also very helpful with introducing me to lots of people from, you know, from being stuck in the kitchen as a, as a chef to now being, being um, an entrepreneur and restaurateur. It's a, a whole different circuit. So you and you, you uh, yourself and you, with your brother were on a number of cooking shows. Right. The first one was an Iron Chef on the Food Network. Also um, a TV show uh, called, on the Food Network called The Ultimate Thanksgiving Feast. Uh, and that was another competition where I actually got to win. And I, I won, but I also made lots of good friends. And, and then uh, you got on Cooked? Chopped. 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 Martha Stewart was was um, an impactful episode where she asked me if I, she could have a reservation that night. And you said no. And I said, well, I didn't say anything. <laughs> right. Then a couple of years later, one of your, you go into business with your friend, Mike, right? Yeah. Um, I have an amazing relationship with my landlord, uh, Rudd Realty, and I got a call from the landlord and said, I have another building down the street on Bedford Street and Carmine. He said, why don't you go take a look at it? And if you're interested, we might be able to make a deal. And that's Market Table. And now that's the corner of Bedford and Carmine. It's a Market Table. Yep. And then since you like clamming so much, you went into the clam business, right? Well, yeah, in, in more ways than one. Um, so Mike Price and I, um, you know, Market Table had been open, it opened in 2007. Uh, so by 2012, uh, of 2011, Mike and I were looking to expand our business and open another restaurant. And he has a beautiful family, uh, two beautiful girls. Uh, and um, he... He wanted to do a restaurant in Brooklyn, and I didn't want to go to Brooklyn, and so I just kept saying, no, 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 I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. We will find some reason why it's right. not going to work, and basically the devil's advocate, and so um, as fate would have it again, while Mike was in the kitchen at market table, a lovely woman walked into the restaurant and said, I have a building on, on Hudson and Leroy street which is actually one of those streets in new york that has two names st luke's and leroy and uh she said i want you to go look at it and see if you want it and it was a restaurant that was previously called anglers and writers so that restaurant had lots of history to it now it's also on a corner like the other two restaurants and now i'm starting to see this trend and we go and we look inside and yes we can get a full liquor license and we believe that we can get community support and um, so, you know, we're so, on a good run. So, so the, as we would say, the empire is growing. You've gone into the catering business. And at a young age, I'm pretty certain that in many years, you're going to be growing this enterprise to many, many levels. Well, I, I, I uh, appreciate that optimism. And rest assured, I am dedicated to it. Okay. And thanks for being here today. Thank you very much.